Hello, Rebels of the Sharp Illusion. Normally, I start off this podcast by saying hi, but I'm going to start this one off by saying hydration. We know how important hydration is for our bodies. It's the thing that keeps us running, right? You want to be a well-oiled machine. You want to be running efficiently. You know what can help you run efficiently? Liquid IV. It is the category-winning hydration brand fueling your well-being and their hydration multiplier is the one product that you are missing in your daily routine. It comes in a little stick that's a powder and in just one stick you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone. If you use it first thing in the morning maybe before a workout when you feel run down maybe after a long night out and doing a little party you know what I mean and what if you have like a long flight or something like that and you just right we all feel that way so add this to your water and that convenient packaging can go with you anywhere you go even if you're going to the gym or you're traveling or you're at work and maybe you didn't have a great breakfast at least it's something that will fuel you up in the morning and there's a whole bunch of flavors that are available like sea berry strawberry lemonade concord grape lemon lime pina colada tropical punch watermelon strawberry passion fruit guava acai berry did i say that right i never know how to say that but Those are just some of the flavors. Here's some statistics for you folks. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and even vitamin C. And we all know how important those B vitamins are. It's got three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It's made with premium ingredients. It's non-GMO and it is free from gluten, dairy, and soy. I'm going to offer you a great deal, Rebels. If you go to liquidiv.com and use offer code SHERPA, you can get 20% off of anything that you order on that site when you're shopping for some better hydration. So that's Liquid IV. Check it out at liquidiv.com. podcast that you're listening to is being presented to you in cooperation with the SJ Network. If you're a person who'd like to appear on a podcast, contact Stephen Joyner at s-j-network.com. Let's get on with the show. This week on the season 12 premiere of too many podcasts? It's a conversation with Ian Fermeglish, the host of the Ian Talks Comedy podcast. Speaking of talking comedy, a man walks into a pet store and asks for a dozen bees. The clerk carefully counts 13 bees out onto the counter. That's one too many, says the customer. The clerk replies, It's a freebie. Welcome to Too Many Podcasts, the podcast about podcasts. Now, podcasting from the Sherpa Chalet on Mount Podcastia, he's your host, Jim, the podcast Sherpa. Hello there, Rebels of the Sherpa Illusion. Welcome to Too Many Podcasts. It is the podcast about podcasts <laughs> and so much more. <laughs> It is me, Jim the Podcast Sherpa, your personal podcast Sherpa, leading you through the hills and valleys of beautiful Mount Podcastia, and I'm talking to you right here from the Sherpa Chalet. Hello there, in Sherpa Lou Studios, of course. And if you've never listened to the show before, I don't know why not, but just in case you haven't, uh, this is the show where you get to know about podcasts. If you're wondering what should you listen to? Or maybe if you want to listen to something new and fresh, you have an opportunity here to get to know other podcasters, find out what they like, and you get information on them as well. And I also do Sherpa Samples, where I have checked out a bunch of episodes that are on the podcast charts and just give you a little synopsis about them. Yeah, that's it. Synopsis. Big word, Sherpa. I like that. But first, our guest today... Who's our guest today, Sherpa? His name is Ian Fermiglitch. He is the host of a podcast called Ian Talks Comedy. And why wouldn't he talk comedy? He is a former stand-up comedian, now a New York City school teacher. Shh, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. It's a big secret. (laughs) I don't know if it's a secret or not. And on his podcast, he gets to talk to folks who have been involved in the creation of comedy from the 60s onward. So... You get a pretty wide variety of funny people to come on his show. So I spent a little time to get to know him, and he doesn't live too far away from the Sherpa Chalet, believe it or not. Well, I mean, if you count the the cruise ship and the helicopter and the three trains you have to take, he's pretty close. He's almost like practically right around the corner. So 
we spent a little time talking. <laughs> that was my point, yes. <laughs> so have a listen to my conversation with Ian from a glitch from Ian Talks Comedy. Hello there, Rebels. We are here in the comedy room, and my guest is Ian Fermeglish. He is the host and creator of the podcast, Ian Talks Comedy. He's here on Long Island, New York, I believe. Yes, one love. Yeah, that's that's the place. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome to the show, Ian. Thank you. How long have you been a stand-up comedian? Well, I don't do it anymore, but I was a stand-up comedian for 10 years. And when, when did that start? About what, what was the decade that you did it? 2001 to 2011. Did you tour nationally or were you a local comic? How, how did that work for you? New York City, Long Island, and uh, as I say with my Long Island accent, <laughs> and then the upper states, Vermont and Delaware a couple of times. An East Coast comic. Yeah. Okay, got it. And then you're, you're now a, a New York City school teacher. I was doing both at the same time. Okay. So I've been, this is my 23rd year as a New York City school teacher. What grade kids do you teach? I teach seniors in Queens, in uh, Richmond Hill, Queens. You're ready for them if they heckle you then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you get much of that or do they know better? Um, honestly, my students don't speak a lot of English. Oh, okay. So the heckles aren't anything I would understand or have to worry about. <laughs> So even if they are heckling you, it doesn't matter. Got you into doing stand-up. I know, you know, that's not always an easy thing for people to do, to just say, so I had one night, you know, hey, I'm going to get up on that open mic and uh, I'm going to tell some jokes. I, you know, I think I thank my dad for this. He, he which is funny because he really didn't want me to be a stand-up comedian, but he was a fan of stand-up comedy. And especially my two favorite stand-ups, Rodney Dangerfield and George Carlin. <laughs> so at a young age, eight, or nine, I would be able to watch, even though George Carlin used, you know, profanity, I was still allowed to watch George Carlin and Rodney Dangerfield. I remember one time Rodney Dangerfield presented Andrew Dice Clay, I had to leave the room. But I did most but, of <laughs> Yeah. But when it was Carlin cursing, it was like allowed. I was allowed to watch that. And Rodney. And those were the two of my favorite, still are two of my favorite comedians. And that's who I wanted to uh, take after. Do you remember your first gig? Was it was it rough? No, actually, it was it was easy. I went to a comedy club in in Levittown, close to where I live now, and I asked if they had an open mic night. And the guy said, "Well, we do, but it we have a comedy class, and that's their graduation. So it's gonna be really tough for you because these people have been taking a class with me." And, and they're all honed and ready to go, and you've never done it before. And they also have like ten or fifteen people at least with them, and you're gonna br- you'll bring six, and it won't go that well. But I did better than everybody else that was in the class. <laughs> and then the he asked me to do a gig the next week in New York City, and I was on the bill with Jim Gaffigan and Jim Norton. That's a pretty uh, <laughs> big step from from yeah, the- was my. Time. What what do you like best about doing stand up? But you know, making the audience laugh is just you know what they what, what people say. But it is true, and it's that communal thing, you know, the audience and giving them an idea that you had a crazy idea that you had in your head, and then they're going, yeah, yeah, that's that's where I thought of that, and you're laughing, and you can see that they thought of that. Once or twice, but never, it never said, you know what, that's, that's funny. I should get up on stage and say it. I know, you know, you say that uh, Rodney Dangerfield and George Carlin were your favorites initially. Are there any comics out now that you think are really worth checking out? Yes. I mean, I kind of gravitate to the older established guys. Like, I love Jimmy Carr. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Carr had Mark Norman open for him. And Mark Norman is hysterical. And um, Shane Gillis is a very funny comedian. These aren't up and comers. They've already, they've already made it. I like Nikki Glazer. I think she's very funny. It's interesting how like stand-up has changed over the years. I mean, the premise itself hasn't changed much, but the material that gets delivered on the stage, there, there doesn't seem to be too much that shocks people anymore, I think, for the most part. No, you're right. Pretty much say anything. 
I'm trying to remember the name of the comedian. Oh, Anthony Jezelnik. Now, I mean, mm. his humor is probably as dark as it's going to get. And yet the guy can still draw a crowd. And like, I guess you have to be ready for a show like his. Because if you're expecting like, hey, what's with the airport? You know, that that's not exactly going to happen to you. Right. That's the only one thing is if you have a crowd, if you have your crowd, then you could do anything and you could become popular. But Going to a regular show where they don't know who you are, then it's still a minefield sometimes of doing of comedy. Mm -hmm. Do you think that political correctness is worse now than it was probably when you first started? Yes, because it's from the left instead of being from the right. And I think even though uh, the I think the right has a better sense of humor about themselves. And I don't think I think the left do doesn't like when you make fun of things that they put in a box and say you can't joke about this you can't, can't use these words mm -hmm. because i had a guest on my show who's who's a comedian and he was a comedy writer wrote for letterman and and, and carson and I, I just showed him my 10 my eight minutes from 2011 okay and he's like oh we couldn't do any of these jokes now really yeah so did, did you swear a lot when you were on stage or not really when i had when, when, when it was needed like i i didn't Excessive. Right, not excessively, exactly. Okay, all right, that's fair. You know, it, it's interesting that people go to comedy shows and they get offended. It's like, <laughs> you think you should know that, you know, the person on stage is going to say something that may or may not trigger you or, you know, and then you have to, that everyone is there for a good time and it's not there to, you know, to single people out and, and call them, you know, tell them that they're worthless or anything like that. Right, I mean, it's like, Let's say one of the worst things you could joke about is like cancer or or rape, and your kid just died of cancer. Well, maybe you shouldn't be going to a stand up show because that might be a topic. Right, exactly. And if it is a topic, they're not talking about you. Right. They're just using it in you know the broad sense. Absolutely. And you know, and people have always said that you know humor is probably the best cure for a lot you know a lot of releases and stuff like that. People have a bad day. What do they want to do? They want to laugh probably at the end of the day. Want to have something to smile about, even if it's not a comedy show. It's just a typical human emotion because it releases all that 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 pent up stuff that's inside you. So at least so your head doesn't explode. Yeah. That's uh, that's like what the whole show Mesh was about. Exactly. It, it took the horror of war and really just gave it a lead character that really just didn't care about the war or anything like that, and he was just funny. Right. And I know you talk with a lot of people on your podcast who've been in like the classic age of comedy, you know, whether like the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. It's amazing that, you know, they were able to come up with that stuff and really know how to deal with it now where today people just, you know, they're just wagging their fingers like, no, you can't do a show about that anymore. There's a quote on a podcast that I listen to that they always talk about and it goes, you know, when Norman Lear, obviously when he was alive, when he'd become on TV, they'd say, they always wanted to thank Norman Lear for knocking down the walls of what you can say, even though we're just building them back up again right now. <laughs> that's that's absolutely right. Yeah, I, I don't think you'd have anybody uh, that could argue that point. You know, what, what do you think caused that shift? I think advertisers are, are scared of getting, but there is no advertising on television anymore. It's all streaming. Yeah. But I guess mainstream Stuff they don't want to get letters and they don't want to get because those letters come from 0.5% of the television audience, but it's enough to scare them. That's right. I know they, they would just talk about that with certain TV shows that, oh, you know, we got letters from the viewers. And like you said, it probably reflects such a small percentage, but I guess they want to try and please everybody. So then nobody's happy in the end. I remember Saturday Night Live is my favorite show. Mm -hmm. And in 1988, uh, Reverend Donald Wildman put out a campaign against Siren Live, and they got 10,000 letters of saying how bad the show was because of a penis sketch that Conan O'Brien wrote about a, uh, a nude beach. And it turned out that those 10,000 letters were, were like copies that he, Donald Wildman had his people all just mail in. But they're like, we got 10,000 letters. Yeah, but they're all from the same person. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't count that way. Well, Domino's dropped them as an advertiser, so it did. 
Yeah, it's crazy that you know that, that people have to look at it that way. You know, like like I said, you, you got to learn how to laugh. You know, at some things, but you know, you kind kind of look at it from the other way that you wonder that if there wasn't some sort of resistance, could comedy have gone maybe too far? You know, where you're in real depths of bad taste, and it's not just oh, this is an offensive to me because you know I'm a woman or I'm black or I'm a man, and you know or my religion, or, you know, whatever it is. You know, I guess it always has to be some sort of a cutoff point. Yeah, but at the same time, I've never seen a, uh, what do they call those movies where they kill people in them? Oh, the snuff film. I've never seen a snuff film. I don't know if one actually exists. <laughs> that would be, that would be the core, that would be my definition of a real no-no. <laughs> and I've never actually seen one or know of one actually existing, maybe on the dark web. But like we have all these boundaries. I don't think anybody really crosses them that nobody would cross them that far. Yeah. That's true. And we, we usually don't see Jim Gaffigan strangling people on stage or anything like that. So yeah, no one's committing murder. So let's talk a little bit about your podcast. Uh, so what got this all started? And during quarantine, which I guess a lot of people say. Mm -hmm. I started to notice that my comedy heroes were dying. And one of my all-time favorite people, Harry Anderson, he died of the flu, which is crazy. Yeah. And um, Fred Willard died. And I never had a chance to tell these people how much I admired their work and how much they made me laugh. So I decided that I was going to do a podcast where I interviewed somebody who at least did wrote one movie I mean, most of the guests I have, done, I've done like 10 or 20 things that I liked. My criteria is wouldn't have a person on who didn't do anything I liked. But I'd have to, if they did one or two, three things I liked, I want to talk about it. I want to tell them what that meant to me, how great, how great it was, and thank them for making the television or movies that I enjoy or being a stand-up comedian. Did you have any favorite guests? So far, and you've done about like around what two hundred episodes so far, right? Yeah, two hundredth episode is going to be taped on Saturday. Okay. Oh, Alan Zweibel, who was one of the original writers of Saturday Night Live, and wrote it and created its Gary Shandling show. That that was a big. He was a big guy. I was trying to get for years. Harry Shearer was another guy I've always tried to get. Uh, and I got, and I was able to talk to him. That was great. Um, Mary Gross was just a great human being. She was on Silent Live uh -huh. in the 80s when Eddie Murphy was on. I've become friends with a lot of the people that I've interviewed. Larry Jacobson, he was, for 10 years, he was the monologue writer for Letterman. And then for 20 years, he did it for Leno. Wow. And he's just a great, he's a great guy. And he's given, he gives me, names and contacts of i talked to this guy about your podcast and he you know he should do that you should talk to him and my favorite sitcom is night court and i talked to every single writer who's still alive that wrote an episode of night court plus i talked to charles robinson who played mac sure and, and he he unfortunately passed away but after we were done with the interview he said he's we were talking about our birthdays are a week apart and he was like, you know, keep in touch. And I said, okay. And he goes, no, 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 not show business, keep in touch. Give me a call. Your birthday is like a week before mine. <laughs> so I gave him a call on his birthday and he called me on my birthday. And it was just like, great. Because it's like, this is a guy I watched for eight years every week. I'm to him on the, on the phone. Well, Night Court really had a couple of former stand-ups, right? Because Harry Anderson was a stand-up and, and a magician. Marshall Warfield. Right. Also. And was, was there someone else who was also a stand up? Bill McGodfrey came on the show at the end. Right. Yeah. That's that's right. I forget about that. And Elaine Boozler. Right. I, I guess, you know, they you know, they knew people were paying who were paying their dues and they said, Come on, TV. Because there was that really big range when if you were a comic, you were getting a TV show. <laughs> it was like Oprah, you get a show, you get a show, you get a show. Yep. And I've talked to, yeah, I've talked to a lot of comedians and I've talked to the people who put those shows together around them. Do you watch the, the reboot of Night Court? Yes. It's pretty good. It's okay. Yeah. I know. Well, Larry Kevin, what, is he the only surviving cast member, I think? Well, no, Marshall Warfield was, was, on, right. was, on, was on Tuesday. Was That's the, right. Yes, I forgot. They are. And then minor characters are still alive. Right. 
Yeah, and I know they just recently lost Richard Mole, as a matter of fact, who played Bull in the original. Right. But he wasn't going to come back. Yeah. They're not, him and Lara Ken are not friends. <laughs> okay. This is, uh, I've learned stuff from the Night Court people. <laughs> You've got all the Night Court dirt. <laughs> There's some good stories, though. Oh, I can imagine. They got to a point where that show got really wild. You know, the humor, like, was starting to teeter the scale a little bit. And, and, and they handle it so well because their writing was so fantastic. One of the coolest things I got from a guest, and I've only gotten like two or three things. I'm not asking for things, mm -hmm. but I wrote, I talked to this guy, talked to Larry Strother. He was one of the executive producers for, for two seasons. And he wrote my favorite episode. And that's the one where they have to do 207 cases in one night uh -huh. or they'll all get, yeah, the classic episode. He's like, I have the script. Would you like it? Because I asked my kids if they wanted my scripts, and they said no. So if I don't give it to them, I'm, it's just going to you know, get thrown away. And I'm like, yeah, yes. He gave me the script, but first he tested me on it. He said, okay, so you know this episode. So what's the first thing that happens? And I told him, and he's like, well, no. And then he goes, oh, wait, this isn't the on-air script. This is the first draft. You're right. That wasn't. In. And then he's like, yeah. And then he gave me the script, which was cool. I'm not sure if it was the same episode, but was that the one where one of the defendants had, what was it, tortoise nervosa? Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to, to, tosa, yeah, something like that, tortoise nervosa. And and he spoke <laughs> really, they did four of those episodes. So what makes you laugh, Ian? I'm, not, I'm a nice person, but not nice things make me laugh. <laughs> I like dark comedy. Okay. But I also like, like, I like happy days, too. Okay. That's one of my favorite shows. I got to talk to Anson Williams, Motsi. Sure. And, um, but, you know, and, uh, like Anthony Jeselnik would make me laugh. R roasts make me laugh. Okay. But now they're doing these things where they, I don't know if you've seen them online, they're just, they, the roast battles and they're in clubs all across the country. And it's just mean spirited. It's not like the roast, like you think, like even right. the roast of Comedy Central, which were vicious, but they were friends of the people. Right. These are just two people who they don't hate each other even. They don't even they just know don't even know each other and they ask like somebody else. So what are the things I can make fun of with that with this person? That I'm not that fond of, but mm -hmm. mostly anything else. Well, what are some of the podcasts that you like to listen to? Okay. I love the TV guidance counselor. I don't know if you've ever listened to that one. No, I've never heard of that. Oh, it's, it's great. It's this guy, and he's been doing it for 10 years. This is his 10th anniversary. He picks, he has a guest on. They pick a TV guide. He has every TV guide. He sends them a PDF of it, and they go through the days of the week, and they what shows they would have watched if that was the current week of television. <laughs> and then they digress, and they talk about other things. And But that's the setup of the whole show. And I'm like, why, why didn't I think of that? It's great. And then I love Dana Carvey and, and Fly on the Wall, Dana Carvey and David Spade. And there's a guy from Barstool Sports named Frank Geary. He's known as, I'm sorry, Mike Geary. He's known as uh, Blind Mike. He has a, a history of comedy podcast called Why Are You Laughing? And that's, he's, it's really good. He has clips of famous comedians in their lives. We have a portion of the show and it is called Shameless Self Promotion. And this is where you can let everybody know where they can get in touch with you and find out what you're doing and uh, if they want to know a little bit more about your show. Shameless self-promotion. Sure. I'm on Twitter. Ian Firm is, at Ian Firm is the handle, I guess. Well, it's like I'm a CB guy. That's my handle. And then uh, Facebook is just, my name is Ian, Ian from English. Um, you can look up Ian Talks Comedy on Google and it's in um, on your phone with the Apple Podcasts. It's also on Spotify. And Spotify is basically the carrier that I use that, that puts the show out. Well, there you have it, folks. Mr. Ian from English, thank you so much for spending a little time. And again, Ian Talks Comedy is the name of the podcast. Thanks for coming by. Thank you. Now it's time for Sherpa Samples. If you've got a podcast you'd like us to sample, contact us, and we'll mention your name on the show. I knew you were waiting for this part. It's time for Sherpa Samples, and it's 
the part of the show where I get to listen to podcasts from here, there, and everywhere on Mount Podcastia and let you know all about them. And here's a new 10 for this week. And some of the news podcasts that I heard were very diverse. Uh, the first one I heard was Who Killed JFK, which you can figure out what that is about. The assassination, of course, of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and it is hosted by news reporter Soledad O'Brien and director and actor Rob Reiner. And I believe it's an eight-part series, and they really break down everything that happened and all of the people who could have possibly been suspects in the assassination of President Kennedy. The Tucker Carlson podcast. Tucker Carlson is a news anchor who previously worked on Fox News, and now he has, a, I guess, a conservative-based podcast. Uh, the interview that I heard, he was talking to uh, one of the Ultimate Fighters about what he does. And uh, it does get political, not heavily on the politics, but I guess it's probably going to depend on who his guest is for the week. Morning Somewhere is hosted by Ashley and Bunny Burns. Uh, I guess they're a married couple. And they just talk about whatever, really. Uh the topics of the day or whatever they happen to cross their minds. Vault is an audio drama. I guess this is one that I probably really should have listened to from the start, but I know there are quite a few seasons of this podcast, and I'm presuming it has to do with people who are in a fictional, like, Arctic outpost, and there are people after them. The, the acting is really well done, as is the audio on the podcast. So if you're into audio podcasts, maybe uh, go back a bit and check it out from the beginning, and you might hear some wild stories going on in this podcast. Within the Wires was also very interesting. It's audio recordings from another dimension, which is how it is described, it's really hard to explain. I guess it's people uh, listening to cassettes that were delivered to them. And the one that I heard had to do with someone, I guess, who was wronged by another individual who's basically threatening revenge on them because they made their life miserable. Uh, it's created by the people who created the podcast Welcome to Night Vale. So if you are a fan of the Welcome to Night Vale podcast, this is probably something that will be up your alley. Another true life story is called The Pirate of Prague that had to do with uh, a gentleman who was running a con with uh, making money selling oil in Prague, Czechoslovakia, or, or Czech Republic, whichever it is now, and how he was able to con all of these people. The Ultimate Human with Gary Brecker is really interesting. Uh, Gary Brecker wasn't a scientist. He was actually someone who sold insurance, but uh, he got fascinated by uh, human mortality, and he has all these different discussions with people, and uh, he, I know he experiments with a lot of different things uh, in his own life, and he, and he talks about that in the podcast as well. The episode that I listened to, he had a discussion with a dentist in, uh, I believe, in Stony Brook, Long Island, and they were talking about how the bacteria in your gums could affect your health. It goes pretty deep as far as the conversation is concerned, so make sure you're brushing and flossing out there, Rebels. We want to have you back next week. Guys with Brian Quinby uh, is a discussion about, well, guys, and... Uh, to give you an example, the episode that I listened to, he had two other guests and they talked about rockabilly guys and, you know, the guys who have that certain rockabilly style with their hairs and pompadours and looking like they're from the 1950s, listen to a certain kind of music and so on and so forth. And he talks about different kinds of guys uh, each and every week. The Jim Cornette Experience is about three hours long on average, <laughs> if not longer. If you don't know who Jim Cornette is, he was a wrestling manager in the 1980s and I believe also a uh, promoter for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And he was the manager of a tag team called the Midnight Express, Sweet Stan Lane and beautiful Bobby Eaton. And uh, he would dress really badly in polyester and he'd have a tennis racket and he would whack people with the tennis racket if he was outside the ring. He does have a lot of Discussions, obviously, about professional wrestling and anything else that pops into his mind. Uh, it's usually him and a couple of co-hosts, and they really go off on a lot of different tangents. He's an interesting guy. He's definitely been in the business a long time uh, with a real uh, interesting perspective. He's kind of like the Joe Rogan of the wrestling world, I think, if you were going to 
stick a label on it. And I believe he also has another podcast called The Jim Cornette drive Through. I haven't heard that one, but I'm guessing it's more wrestling talk. And lastly, Red Thread is a podcast that is hosted by three guys who get kind of goofy, and they discuss cryptids. Now, I guess we've discussed cryptids in a previous episode, and those are the creatures that uh, urban legends are made of. And in this episode, they discussed the goat man. Now, the goat man, I've never really heard of that. Have you heard of that, Lord Mr. Bruce? No? Yeah, I would have to say, to that also. Oh, well, and on that note, I think it's time to head into the outro. Let's get back to the Sherpa. Sorry about that. No! Thank you so much to Ian for swinging by the show and check out his podcast if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the history of comedy. And, you know, also stay here for more laughs. We've got chockfuls of them. Chockfuls? I don't know. It worked for coffee. I don't know. And you can listen to the show right where you are right now or any other podcast apps or on SherpaLution.com or the SherpaLution YouTube channel, which is at SherpaLution5000. Ooh, sounds futuristic, doesn't it? Ooh. <laughs> and if you could please leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts and for your trouble of doing so, once we get 100 reviews, we're going to have a drawing with all the people who've reviewed and you can win some podcast merchandise absolutely free. It's on my dime. I will send it right to you. Yes, you. Now, this is the beginning of season 12. So you're thinking, wow, I just started listening to this podcast and there's 11 seasons behind me. Well, here's something great, Rebels. You know, if you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, after 300 episodes, the first ones start dropping off. So for the benefit of those who've never heard those first episodes, and you still like to listen on Apple Podcasts, you can hear some of my early episodes on Saturdays, and we're calling them Sherpa Selects. So if you listen this Saturday, we will be starting that up. My very first episode, and you'll hear a big difference in the audio. And five years ago, when I was just a little meek, inexperienced Sherpa. But anyway, I hope you enjoy it, because I know that the first season of the show is very popular, very popular. Lots of people like to listen. Yes, yes, millions, millions listening. I, I don't know millions. I don't know. I can't count that high. Might have been five or six. I don't know. But anyway, if you're interested, check the show out. And we'll be back next time with another interview, I'm sure. And until then, I say to you, viva la revolution. Thanks for listening to Too Many Podcasts. Please disperse. You can go home now. I said you can go home now. Viva la revolution. Viva la Chapalition. <coughs> oh. Yo, come back now, you hear? You know, Rebels, if you've been checking out some of my promotional ads on social media, you will be aware that I have been using a lot of AI programs to help me create ads. But you know what? There's a lot more uses for AI than just funny little videos. And I'd like to introduce one of our new sponsors, Podium. It is a leader in creating AI tools for podcasters. Now, let's say you've got a podcast and maybe you're even thinking of doing a podcast. You're probably wondering, well, how can AI be integrated with your workflow? I'll tell you about Podium. As a podcaster, you know that writing show notes and creating chapters and transcribing episodes takes a lot of time and it can cost you a lot of money too. But you know what? That's where Podium comes in. It's an AI tool designed specifically for creators and podcasters with the goal of making post-production tasks quick and easy. And in just a few minutes, Podium generates show notes, chapters, summaries, clips for social media, a full transcript, suggested episode titles, social media posts, and more. Whew, that's a lot of work for one little program. You're your show notes are key to your podcast success because it helps new listeners find your podcast and they'll know if it's a fit for them. You know, it kind of like too many podcasts. It also improves your SEO. That's your search engine optimization. Ooh, big phrase there. And overall accessibility. And with Podium, you can focus on creating a great podcast and let Podium's AI do the heavy lifting. But Podium isn't just for solo creators and podcasters. It's a game changer for editors, producers, marketers, agencies, and production studios. Teams that use Podiums are able to increase workloads, decrease turnaround times, and improve their quality. How does it work? Very easy. 
First, go to Podium's website, and you'll see that link that's right there in the show notes. You get three hours free just to try it. Pretty cool, huh? And using that link also supports this show as well. And you know what else happens? Because I'm a good guy. You use my link, you will get 50% off for your first month. So visit the site, upload an MP3 file, and download your files, and that's it. And if you need anything else, you can use Podium GPT to generate articles and any marketing copy you might need in seconds instant show notes transcripts chapters for your podcast or channel this will level up that podcast so check out podium today